personal note, I'm, oh, on somewhat of a personal note, I'd like to note the passing of John Crass. Uh, he was class of 62. I don't think I've ever met a, an alum more passionate about Williams College than, than John Crass. And I, I would not be here tonight without John. When we first met, um, he recognized that I've got very ambivalent feelings about my time at Williams, but through our friendship and time together and just seeing his passion for the school, he really helped me uh, see Williams in a new light. And uh, he died uh, last December and uh, he was a, a passionate member of the Alumni Association. I think he was on the board for at least 30 years. So we will, we will miss him here in Northern California. Um, my other announcement is since our last get together, uh, Dr. Gozon has received a major promotion in recognition of his work for the state of California. He's now acting medical director for the California Emergency Medical Services Authority uh, with new statewide responsibilities. And I'm sure he'll tell us more about his new role during the Q&A period. I'd like to thank the Williams Northern California Alumni Association for helping to make this evening happen. Uh, Vlad, Chris, or Josh, are any of you on the line and would you like to say something? If so, uh, please let Rob know. If not, I'll move forward to thank the college's alumni association and especially Rob Swan for his efforts and help in supporting putting tonight together. So Rob, thanks a lot. I think you wanted to say a word on behalf of the uh, alumni association. Thank you, thank you, Jay, for uh, organizing tonight's event. Thanks, Hernando, of course, for joining us again. It's, you know, uh, we were just discussing as we were getting things set up. It's like, I mean, it's wonderful to have alumni who are willing to, to share their knowledge with everyone. Uh, it's disappointing that we're still here, right? It's like we, we, we did the first one of these over a year ago, I think. Um, and, uh, but obviously, it's just wonderful to, to, to hear the updates and, and, and trying to keep everybody uh, and their friends and family um, safe and um, just being as productive as possible. So um, as far as like Williams, you know, it's, it's winter study. They, you know, last year they didn't have winter study. This year they're back. Um, Williams is going to be remote for, I think, the first 10 days or something, the second semester. Um, they just, just to allow everybody for, if they're traveling, to get back um, and then, you know, have a little bit of a, of a, a period of adjustment and making sure that everybody's cleared again before they're back in the classroom together. But uh, you know, it's it's very complicated. You know, I mean, as as you guys know, um, gathering in big groups like so. The, I guess the NESCAC has had. If you go to sports events, uh, you have to be vaccinated and wearing a mask at all times. But then, even even now for for the month of January, all indoor sports events, um, it's just students, faculty, and staff who are tested on a regular basis. Parents can't come, or you know, other other general member fan members. Of the of general population can't can't get on campus, so it's unfortunate that we're not we haven't quite made it back to a, a normal. But so I'm very interested to hear the update from you, Dr. Garzon. Um, and um, I guess with that, let me turn it back over to you, Jay, for the intros. And um, you know, if anyone has any questions for me, uh, please use the chat. Feel free to uh, rename yourselves. Uh, like I said I think you can chat with everybody, and then Jay will explain about how we'll do the Q and A. I guess when you know after the initial remarks, how we're going to work or something like that. Um, and with that, let me turn it back over to Jay. So thanks again. Thanks, Rob. So the agenda and logistics for the meeting. In a moment, I'll hand it off to Dr. Garzon, who will give a short presentation. Then Bill and I will exercise our moderator privileges and ask some questions. We'll then open it up to questions from the audience. We'll, we have a large house tonight, so please uh, submit your, your questions in the chat room. I assume we're all Zoom experts by now and know how to do that. I'll be monitoring the chat room questions and I'll let you know if your question has been accepted and give you an idea of where you are in the queue. And then I'll call you when it's your turn. When it is your turn, please give us your name, your class and your Williams uh, affiliation or your Williams affiliation, you might be a parent. Uh, and then your senior year house, if you have one, uh, when you introduce yourself, then ask your question. And due to the size of the audience, we may have to limit any follow-up questions you have for Dr. Garzon. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hernando Garzon. In addition to most notably being a member of the class of 84, he has worked in emergency, in emergency medicine for over 30 years. He was a first responder on 9-11 and in Oklahoma City. His international experience includes responding to disasters in, uh, such as the Ebola outbreak in Africa, 
hurricanes in Haiti and tsunamis in Asia. When he's not responding to global disasters or supporting the state of California, he's one of Kaiser's leading ER physicians in the Sacramento area. I have to say it is with mixed feelings that I introduce him tonight. Um, good evening, Hernando. Uh, good evening, Jay, and thank you everybody for joining and for having the interest. Uh, Jay, why do you have mixed feelings? Well, dude, we have to stop meeting like this. I mean, <laughs> really? well, I think as Rob said, you know, that this feels like a like a one too many sequels, right? Like, you know, they should have stopped after the first sequel. Like, the, we really did, didn't need the third or fourth sequel of that movie series. That is true. Um, so for sure. So let me. Um, so I, I think as we've done before with with these others, I, I think I'll do a presentation of some slides. Hopefully, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. To show you some data, which is the world that I live in, and I, I think our, you know, in science and in medicine, we try and make evidence-based decisions, right? Use to use data to, to drive decisions and policy making, and so so I think the numbers are important. Um, and just to allude to what Jay had mentioned, I've been uh, working largely with California Department of Public Health over the last two years, specifically around the hospital data and hospital metrics. Yeah. A couple of months ago, the um, one of the 12 departments under Health California Health and Human Services, which has public health, Department of Aging, Social Services, have 12 departments. One of them is called this, the California EMS Authority. And so that is the state um, agency that oversees all of the 32 local agents of the state. And the director for that, um, for that agency, pummeled with COVID for two years, retired. Um, a friend and colleague of mine, but I'm a, I'm the acting medical director for the California EMS Authority, so I have have some additional responses, and it's all been around COVID uh, responsibility for that. So let me uh, let's see slideshow. Let me share my presentation. Okay, okay. one second. Let's do it this way. Okay. Um, I see it. Kind of, so you're seeing a PowerPoint. I can see. Yeah, yeah, you're in. You're in the outline view, but not presentation view. Okay. How's that? There you are. Perfect. Okay. Um. Yeah. So I suppose this is version of three or the Omicron update here. Um, so let's see if we can go. So this is just the, the start or the splash. I, one of the, uh, the best public sites for COVID that I like, I think I mentioned this before, the New York Times site, it has wonderful interactive views that you can go from global to, uh, to national to by state and even it, it breaks down in the counties. And so just look up the New York Times COVID and I'm sure that this page will come up, but this is the heat map I think from today of where we are as a country around the Omicron surge and COVID. Fortunately, we're actually starting to see a slight decrease in many states that had the early start. New York is improving. Um, certain other states are seeing a, a slight decrease in cases. We're falling out in California for sure, although we still have some places like Rhode Island, which are very hot. Um, and as usual, this is varied ar uh, around, uh, around the globe and around the state in terms of impact. Um, and many of these slides are stolen from one of my public health presentations or one of the ones I receive and I've tried to sit on, on the things that would be interested for this audience. So this is sort of current data. So the, I added the US data to the California data, right? So we're up to over 68 million cases in the US, almost 7 million in California. New today in the US, almost three quarters of a million, which is really astonishing. Uh, 86,000 California. If you're looking at deaths in the United States now, we're over 857,000 deaths. This is more deaths than in all that we've ever bought in. You've probably heard that. Globally, the death count is over 6 million and, uh, and COVID has surpassed the death rate, the estimate death rate for the Spanish flu uh, in 1918. So th this is really a pandemic of, of an eon uh, not just of a century, but certainly of an eon. Um, in California, we've had over 77,000 deaths. Um, in, and uh, this is 176 about a day. 
uh, graphics below or from the New York Times. And uh, you can see the comparison to last winter surge, this, the big peak that we had last winter. So Omicron, as you've heard, is far more transmissible, far more cases, far more infectious. So we've seen this huge spike in California. We're 400% the number of cases that we had last winter and in the US more than 300. Um, <clears throat> so this is the case trend in California. Uh, summer bump here, last summer, you know, it's, it almost seems um, like nothing as much as we were going crazy at the time. But then this is our big winter peak. Um, I don't know if you can see, can you guys see my cursor as I float over? Yeah, we got it. Okay. Uh, so this was the big winter peak that hit everybody. This is the peak in the summer of 21. And then this, of course, is what Omicron is doing in terms of cases. You can just see how tremendous this is. The national curve in the New York Times looks very similar to this, uh, to California's. Um, and then this is the death curve. Um, again, quite high in, in winter peak. Then we had our Delta peak, but the the at least if there's a saving grace about Omicron is that it's as much as it is more transmissible, it also, is it also virulent? Now, deaths lag by several weeks from cases, of probably three to four weeks. So we don't, this data is a bit incomplete. At the end, we, we are expecting to see a bump in, in deaths, of course, because we've had a, a, such a huge surge in cases, but hopefully the, the, it will be less. And then this is an overlay of the cases, which is blue. And this was this is similar to you know winter surge here, delta surge here, and then the huge peak that we have right now for Omicron. You follow that with hospitalizations, which are yellow. Um, and so we're seeing a significant bump in hospitalizations. Um, this winter peak in hospitalizations in California was about twenty two thousand COVID patients. The delta surge was eighty three hundred. And we're already up to over 15,000 COVID hospitalizations in California right now. So it, it doesn't match the, the peak of cases, which is because of the decreased virulence, but 15,000 new patients in the hospital is still quite significant uh, and creates a, a significant impact. And then the death deaths um, here are in red, again, quite high during the win last winter's peak uh, less so with Delta, and it really has not yet significantly bumped, even though we expect it will. Uh, um, for those um, science-oriented or more, rem remember the R effective is the reproductive number. Um, so it's the number of patients one or people that one infected person will infect. Right. So if it's below one, you have decreasing number of cases. If it's above one, you have a growing number of cases. Because if one person infects two, then you have growth. And so these, this, uh, our effective calculations, you can see from the winter peak here, the delta peak here. And we, when we started seeing our effectives of 1.5, 1.6, um, we all were extremely concerned. And that's been the cause of the very rapid rising that we've seen. Um, a little bit about the different impact in age groups. We've talked about this before, but I wanted to show you this trend. So I'll go back and forth on these two slides a bit here, because what this is showing is the percentage of total cases by age group. So, and in this, this particular graphic starts with the youngest at the top. So uh, you can see zero to five in the red, six to 11 in the peach. Um, and then this, uh, this 12 to 14 to 17 age group in the salmon color. So I think of this as the pediatric age range, these three colors. Uh, and you can see that, that it really has accounted for up to 25% of cases. But then the older age group, the one that we know has higher risk of, of poor outcomes and hospitalizations and death in this graphic, the 65 plus, accounts for, has accounted for somewhere around 11%, 7%, even 6% now that we have most of that population immunized, right? So I'll go, I'll go back and forth. So this is cases. This is the graphic for the admissions um, by age to hospitals. So remember that the pediatric population, zero to 17 is about 25%, 20%. Well, they've accounted for, and, and this is in reverse, the zero to 17 is the blue. 
So historically, even though they've been about 20, 25% of the hospitalization of the cases, they've only been two or 3% of the hospitalizations. Now we've heard that Omicron infects more pediatric patients and we're seeing that a bit because we're getting more, but it's up to about three or 4% of hospitalizations are caused or in the pediatric age group. And again, if we go back to that six, to, to this graphic for cases, remember the 65 plus crowd um, is around six to 11% of the cases, but they account for this yellow stretch here. They account for 50, anywhere from 45 to upwards of 60% of the hospitalizations over time. So there's a, obviously, as we know, a, an age significant difference. Um, a couple things about gene uh, uh, gen genomic sequencing, the difference between Delta, I'll go through these a bit quickly, and Omicron. So this is the United States CDC data, so, and you can see the week here going back to October and where we are in the present. The orange is Delta and the purple is Omicron. So essentially the CDC is estimating that at this point nationally, more than 99% of cases are Omicron. This is how quickly it's happened. Really over the course of these four weeks, it went from essentially zero in early December to, to 99%. Uh, looking at the sequencing in California, it's quite similar. So this is sequencing data from, Calif from California broken up by, by regions. So this is the San Joaquin Valley, Central Valley. This is the San Francisco Bay Area. This is the greater Sacramento area, Southern California, which includes Los Angeles, San Diego, and then ranchos, the rural North California, Redding and, and the, the less populous counties up North. But this is the state color here. So again, this, this goes along with the data I just showed you nationally from the CDC. This is green. So going back to August, July, when we had our Delta surge, as we call it, or summer surge, Delta took over fairly quickly from the prior events, but Omicron has done the same thing, right? It went from almost zero in the early days of November to now almost 90% in California of the of variants. Um, okay, so this, let's go through some more data about cases and hospitalizations for vaccinations. Um, I, I don't know how many of you, I think Jay might be the only one who remembers that in my tenure at Williams, I was the, I was the music director for WFM, the radio station. <laughs> so, uh, so I had to throw this in, but I'll, I, I think it'll be self-evident from the, for these next slides, what the cure to COVID is. Um, so this is from the New York Times website, uh, national data. So this lower line here, the each color is be vaccinated. And this red line here, this is for average daily cases, is the unvaccinated. So by this national data, you're five times more likely uh, to, to be a case if you're unvaccinated. Same thing with deaths. Fully vaccinated is in the gray line, unvaccinated population here in the darker gray line, 13 times as high if you're unvaccinated. If we look at some California data, so this is what happens with cases. If you're fully vaccinated, you're the dotted line. If you're unvaccinated, you're the solid line. So by you look at these case rates, you're four times, the case rate is four times higher in the unvaccinated population. So that's cases. Let's look at hospitalizations. So hospitalizations are six times higher if you're unvaccinated. So solid line is unvaccinated for hospitalizations dotted line is the, is the vaccinated. Let's look at ICU. So ICU rates, seven times higher for unvaccinated. Uh, so the unvaccinated is the solid line and the ICU is, or the uh, vaccinated population in the ICU is this, is this dotted line. And then finally, let's look at deaths, 19 times higher. So if you look at the death rate for unvaccinated, the solid line, and the death rate for uh, fully vaccinated in the, solid, in the dotted line below. So this is the, the table representation of this data, the difference in case rates between vaccinated and unvaccinated, difference between hospitalization rates, difference between ICU rates, and difference between death rates. And you can just look at this. I mean, this has the, I like the table because it also the absolute numbers, right? So if we're looking at the last six months from July, 
over 10,000 cases in California have been in unvaccinated, whereas just 2,000 cases have been in the unvaccinated crowd. Um, this is another way to look at similar data. I like this graphic as well. This, so look, this is looking at the vaccine effectiveness um, <clears throat> for cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. So if you're vaccinated, and this is over time, what's, wh how effective the vaccine at preventing a case? Um, and that's the green line. And again, with Omicron, as you've heard, it's a different variant. Does it look different? Do the vaccines work as well? So here's the evidence that they don't work as well, but they still work pretty well. And what's interesting is there's definitely been a significant dip in the vaccine effectiveness with Omicron, right? It's not up above 87%, it's down to around 77%. That's to get it. But it's, it's effectiveness has remained pretty good for hospitalizations and it's remained excellent for deaths. So the vaccine effectiveness at preventing deaths is this purple line and it's still quite high, even with Omicron through this stretch. Um, <clears throat> this is look at similar data uh, by age group. Um, so, so for vaccinated, um, people up to 15 is the yellow line, uh, 16 to 49 is the green line, the 65 and older uh, population is this blue line. So you can see that there's a more, more drop in effectiveness for younger populations. What's, what's excellent though, again, is that the, the effectiveness against hospitalizations and deaths remains quite good for all age groups. This has come up before. I thought I'd show it quickly. People say, well, I got J&J. &J. I hear it's not as good. I got Moderna. I got Pfizer. What should I do? So the, the interesting thing is that even though this data supports what we've heard in published media reports, that J&J, &J, which is this orange line, is perhaps less effective because there's a higher case rate or there's a higher hospitalization rate with J&J, &J, um, that's still the best benefit from the unvaccinated population, which is upper uh, red to purple line, the benefit for all of the vaccines is quite good. So I think in the end, any vaccine is good and Jane and Moderna and Pfizer are slightly better. All right, not two not two more slides. So um, the boosters, questions about boosters. So boosters help they work. So um, the solid line unvaccinated, the dashed line is fully vaccinated. Two, that means two series or one if you were J&J, &J, and then the little lines are booted. So here in this January period, right, and where we're in with Omicron, this was the benefit of getting vaccinated from the solid line to the dot line, but then here's the be benefit of getting boosted. So there's definitely a, a benefit from having a booster as well uh, on, your, on your series. And this is the benefit for cases. Here's the difference between hospitalizations for unvaccinated, vaccinated, and then fully boosted here, and then same with deaths. So if you're not boosted, and hopefully you are, get, uh, get boosted. And then again, uh, similar, just that this, uh, the, the effectiveness graph, the difference between uh, vaccinated, which are the yellow lines, and then the vaccinated plus boosted in the green lines. And then uh, by age group, for vaccine effectiveness, again, as we talked about. So the, if you break down the, the boosted, by age group also benefits there compared to just the unvaccinated. And then the difference at, at saving hospitalizations for boosted, right? If you're boosted, there's a, over 95% uh, effectiveness at preventing a hospitalization. Okay, my last slide. So, <clears throat> You know, there, there have been so many cases, you've seen the case spike. So one of the other things we talk about, and this is a hard thing to get a number, is community prevalence, because we, we talk about, um, we do testing, but we're obviously testing a small percentage of the population. 
to get a community press, you have to do random sampling, population random sampling testing. Um, th there's some protocols to test sewage water, those kinds of things. So at the, at the middle of the Omicron surge in New York City, there were some estimates that one in 25 people walking around the street had COVID. So that's a lot, right? You're in a crowd of an urban city, 400 people in a supermarket or walking down the street or something or in a restaurant that has 50, 80 people, there's a good chance someone in there has COVID, right? I just heard this on a report this morning in San Diego. The feeling is at this moment, one in four people walking in San Diego have COVID. So, and I suspect most of you on, on, on this conference call probably know more people who've gotten COVID in the last month than anywhere, any other time in, in the pandemic. And again, because the prevalence of Omicron has been so huge, thank goodness a uh, smaller number get hospitalized. Um, I did four emergency department shifts at the end of December, uh, dutifully wearing my N95 masks. Um, I saw more of it in four days than I have in any other stretch of shifts in the emergency department in the last two years. Uh, and uh, I, you know, it's interesting because at the beginning of, I had a certain degree of fear going to work in the emergency department, knowing we would, we would see this and, and understanding what the infectious disease protocols were and in control and prevent protocols. Um, I probably 50% of the patients I saw during those four shifts either had symptoms related to or wanted testing and ended testing. So there was much heavier presence of COVID in the, in the emergency department during those shifts. And then it turns out that after New Year's, um, I tested positive for COVID because I had a scratchy throat and a sore throat. And that, that what I identified as the hot, most likely source of that was the 30 minutes I spent in my MS office with six staff, office staff, none of us were wearing masks. I was there, I stopped in to have some conversations and do some email and I was out the door uh, and I tested positive. And so uh, the, I, I believe it was this, this letting your guard down indoor space in public with such a high prevalence of COVID because it turns out that two of those staff workers turned out to be positive um a day later so they were clearly a source of of uh of contact with a known covid patient or person um and so that was the source of my infection um and so it's just interesting that uh, i think with the community prevalence we have uh, there's a much more significant concern about all of us exposed and i believe this is the reason why the recommendations have gone back to uh to full mask wearing and all indoor spaces. A, a lot of public health departments have been talking about uh, re essentially bringing back mandatory indoor masking. I, I think even in, I've read articles saying even in democratic states that there's very little political will to do things like close sectors and go to stay at home and, and those kinds of things for economic reasons and, and, and people who you know, fight about the, 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 the negative impacts of those kinds of of uh, impositions and public health orders or uh, NPIs, non-pharmaceutical intervention to decrease transmission. And I think that um, our uh, public health and political leaders have been more willing to let this run its course because of the lower virulence, the lower likelihood of hospitalization and deaths, but it has still caused a tremendous uh, alteration of our social fabric again, because you still need to isolate if you're infected. And I spent uh, seven days in a hotel room away from family and, and all of that kind of thing. So I, it has a significant impact on all of us, even if we're not sick enough to go to the hospital um, or have a fatal outcome that it, it really it disrupts our, our life more than your typical flu or cold will. So, but I'll stop there and open it up for questions. Thank you, Hernando. And uh, I, I was going to ask one question, but now I'm going to ask two. And, and, and I really appreciate your, you sharing your story. Can you tell us how you feel today? I mean, I, I know you pretty well. You, your voice sounds a little bit weaker than normal. Yeah, it's still a little off. So I would say that I had, this was a, a, a very mild to moderate cold. I, I've had colds where I was far sicker and the guys in bed and just felt lousy. I mean, I I think I may have had a little bit of fever one day. I, I, I had a bad sore throat for two days. I actually didn't start coughing all day ever six. And they say that the cough and congestion with Omicron can last weeks. I still have my voices a little altered, but 
I feel certainly fine, 100% in terms of, of all other symptoms and energy level. Got it. Okay. Um, I'll ask my question then. You know, one of the things I feel extremely passionate about is, you know, as much as I love my New York Yankee cloth face mask and think it's a perfectly fine fashion accessory, um, I've been reading article after article about how ineffective cloth masks are versus Omicron. Can you talk about the effectiveness of K95, K95 or N95 masks versus Omicron? And for anyone who's curious, I posted, I think, a couple articles on the New York Times, uh, from the New York Times on this question. But let's, let's hear it from you. Uh, cloth masks versus N95 versus Omicron. So I, I was looking for a, a California Public Health graphic that I wanted to add to the slides and I couldn't find it, but it's uh, it, the, um, the public health official for the state, Dr. Argon, has this on his background for Zooms and it's better, it's good, better, best. And then above each word is a mask. So good is a surgical mask, better is KN95 and best is N95. And then I, he, it, I think that the cloth mask doesn't even make that list, Jay. So, so yes, be clear that cloth masks are not as good as even the surgical masks that you can that you can acquire. Those are definitely better filtration. But N95 masks are the that's what that's what health workers wear in the hospital when interacting with a COVID positive patient. So N95 worn properly. Is the, is the most effective. Now, technically by uh, uh, OSHA standards, N95 masks are supposed to be fit tested. So in healthcare, you actually try the mask on, someone sniff with some, some fragrance in front of you and you're supposed to tell whether or not you can smell the fragrance. And if you do fail that mask test. So N95 masks, if you have facial hair or if it hasn't been fit tested, you don't know if it gives the same filtration that someone working in a hospital who's been fit tested to know that that's the right mask for them uh, works. But still, N95 is definitely better. The difference between KN and 90, KN95s and N95s is more a matter of quality of the mask. The filtration works the same way, but the KN95 masks are supposed to fail sooner or earlier, usually the straps are a little more flimsy and all of that. So KN95s are fine if, if the mask is in, intact and, and fitting appropriately, they're just as good as N95s. But if they get weak or break, or you, they probably won't last so long, get N95s if you can. Excellent. And, I'll point, and then I'll, in terms of masks, oh, go ahead, keep going. I, I would just, just, yeah, because I think this goes to the community prevalence conversation I had. So I. I would at this point, if I hadn't just had COVID three weeks ago, two weeks ago, I would um, I would fly with N95 mask as I did in the early when we went back to flying six months into this, and uh, because in in a plane three hours, six hours prolonged exposure in a meeting room with strangers, if you have to do an in-person meeting, even in the supermarket at this point, I would wear an N95 mask. Um, over other options, if you're, if you're, even if you're vaccinated, as you can see. Awesome, good. Well, I, I heard actually that your your um, meals during your confinement were actually expertly prepared by a mutual friend of ours, so it wasn't all bad. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand this over to Bill, and I'm going to get ready to moderate the Q and A in a few minutes. But Bill, I'll take it for a few questions. Very good. Thanks, Jay. Actually, Jay. Uh, New York Yankees masks actually attract the virus, so you need to be super, super careful there. So, yeah, I see the gym with the Red Sox, so those are that's probably okay. But anyway, he's been, he's been plaguing me since 1980. This is yeah, um, of course, so, your Yankee mask sucks. So, uh, Fernando, um, so it was interesting to me, um, because I had been reading and saying, well, that the uh, with Omicron, the vaccines are protective from uh, uh, severity of disease, hospitalization, and death, but, but not really protective uh, on infection. And your data is, it doesn't, it doesn't say that. And so, and so, but you science guys will tell us that uh, 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 correlation is not the same as causation. And so uh, speculate, are the people you know, is it really the vaccines that are protected from cases or people who are vaccinated maybe more likely to 
to take uh, to, to wear masks and, and and be more cautious or I mean what what do you think? You know that's a, a great question uh, and that is variable that we can't control for that well. So the other behaviors besides masking obviously matter, right? The social distancing, the willingness to not go out to dinner as much and, and go to those high risk environments like restaurants where people are unmasked and sit for longer periods. So all those kinds of behaviors may also be higher in populations that are willing to get vaccinated. But I, I a couple of things, I, I think the dramatic difference in, um, in case rates between vaccinated and unvaccinated are clearly swayed towards the vaccine efficacy and the others. And actually the, you know, the studies that, that uh, Pfizer and Moderna did initially looked at and controlled for those other variables, right? Their control group, they, they look at social interaction, social distancing, time in restaurants, all this other stuff for those populations. So when they showed a benefit from vaccines, they had better controlled for the other behavior variables. Uh, yeah. And it just shows that the, the vast benefit was from the vaccine itself and not just other behaviors. So if people are saying, oh, uh, you know, it doesn't work against Omicron, that's not, that's not accurate. So um, very good. Um, so I assume that with your new uh, job with the state, that that comes with a crystal ball. And so if you pull out, if I ask you to pull out your crystal ball and look ahead, you know, say six months, you know, when it's summer and then and 12 months when it's winter again, you know, what, what do things look like, you know, in California? What do we, you know, what do things look like in terms of case rates, in terms of hospitalizations? Uh, uh, do we still have mask rules? You know, do we still have limits on gatherings? You know, what's your, obviously this is speculation, but what's your, your best guess? Right. Well, I was going to say, I or the crystal ball when I the day I was given the position, but it just still hasn't come in. So I think you're dealing with speculation. But this is an interesting conversation, Ashin. We're still having it. And the funny thing is, in the middle of with this Omicron surge, we're already talking about when does pandemic become endemic. Uh, and as you've probably heard Fauci and others talk about this, the the belief now that Omicron is not going away, like SARS or MERS or maybe some of these other things we've seen, but will probably be become cyclic and much like influenza, might be seasonal, we may get outbreaks, but at what point is something sort of endemic, right? Where it shows up now and then you have little outbreaks here or there, whether seasonal or regional, but it doesn't give us this volume of cases, this number of deaths, this number of hospitalizations. And so that's the interesting challenge. I mean, before the variant of Omicron, we thought that, that we were getting there after Delta. So, so here's the thing. I think that if we have no new variants in the horizon, that enough people have gotten Delta and Omicron and enough people have gotten vaccinated and boosted and all of those other things that we're approaching that quotes herd immunity concept where even if there is disease in the community, you'll have relatively small numbers of cases and you won't have these pandemic levels of we have to close sectors, we have to do this, we have to do that. Um, but with, with the possibility of, and this is total speculation is, you know, th this is where I need the crystal ball to come in, is what's the next variant cause another Omicron like thing. So we don't, that's not, that's not, um, that's possible. It's not implausible that we, we would have another variant like Omicron or like Delta that's just different enough to, to cause a threat to the population, even the vaccinated population. One slide that I couldn't find that I was gonna throw in there that we're talking about is reinfection rates. So right now with all these cases, this 80,000 cases we're getting in California, we're finding that about 4% of those had COVID before. And the definition of that is someone who had test positive COVID 90 days more after their current uh, infection, right? So it had to be Delta or another variant. So we're definitely seeing about 4% of current cases in California are reinfections at this point. They're Omicron, who's, they're no longer immune. I don't know about vaccine status on those patients, but they, they, they definitely had a COVID before. So other variants may cause that. 
I would say that masking is a new thing that will factor in. I mean, we had most no influenza last year, and we typically have 40 to 60,000 deaths in this country from flu. We're just a wheel about it. Most probably get our flu shots because we know we should, but uh, you know, not the whole population. And I think what what this pandemic has shown that masking, social distancing, hand washing, those kinds of things, when you are having a seasonal outbreak of any respiratory transmitted infection is going to help. So Very in good. some ways, I believe that masking is not going to go away completely, even at the low points of infection. So there's, there's maybe a, as we get through this, maybe a silver lining that people will be a little more more safe in their, in their normal behaviors. I think, I'm going to turn it back to Jay, who's been... Uh, uh, checking the uh, the chat and uh, uh, Jay, you've got your uh, your, your uh, lineup. I, I do, I do. Our first question comes from Chris. Uh, I believe it's Matsai who has a question about uh, statistics and whether or not uh, the COVID uh, virus or the response to it has changed the use of statistics uh, in terms of analyzing. Um, uh, uh, events such as this uh, pandemic. And he used a phrase, I believe it's st statistical utility and whether or not ha that has changed. Uh, Hernando, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I don't know if, so here's my thought. I think that um, public health and particularly infectious disease public health science has been deep in statistics around um, modeling, predictive analysis uh, on everything like are effective in case rates and prevalence. And I, I think that statistics has been a part of infectious disease outbreaks and public health for a long time. I think the challenge has been looking for uh, real time quality data to feed into those uh, predictive models. Um, and the realities of trying to do random sample population testing to estimate community prevalence. And, you know, that you, you can sit down as a statistician or mathematician and, and put this out, okay, this is how we can get the answer. But then actually applying that and finding the funding for that and the, and the, the people that are going to do that and run those numbers are the challenge. Now, I don't know if I'm understanding the questions. So if I'm not, perhaps... Perhaps the writer can. Um, I, I think I, I have it now uh, point by point. Is this pandemic causing changes in statistical gathering and use? If so, what are they? And are they going into effect now? I see Omicron is confounding statistical utility. That's the question. Yeah. So I think it's, yeah. And I would say that it, it really, it has created the challenge of in a, in a real time environment, how do we get the data we need? to put into all of the models and all of the things. That, so the, the implementation of data gathering is the challenge for doing the statistical analysis we already know how to do. Because what's really interesting is as an afterthought, like the, a lot of data came, a lot of analyses and, 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 and statistics were applied retrospectively to SARS and MERS and HIV and, and even you know, the Spanish flu a hundred years ago. So the, 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 the statistical mathematical analyses are there. The challenge is getting the data in the real time that you need. And Thank you. Um, I've been asking the question, how did this guy get in for about 40 some years now? Uh, Jim Clark, uh, you're, you're up. Good, just gotta have this in place. Um, <laughs> I, Hernando, you, you, uh, touched on some of the things that I wanted to talk about, but I, I, as a person who has joined you in the COVID club um, with a breakthrough infection, I'm curious about uh, how Omicron protects against the other variants, against Delta, other stuff. And does this mean um, that the less nasty Omicron displaces the nastier version longer term outcomes. This, this gets kind of to your reinfection discussion. 
Right, absolutely, right? Because we these these Omicron infections that are, we're seeing now that are reinfections, they were Delta or some other variant. So what about if Omicron is your first infection? We're, we're, we're not gonna be three months from now when we see a Delta spike or something like that or a new variant. And unfortunately, we just don't have enough data to know, right? Because the, the interesting thing, I think both you and I have been, and, and everyone in this group have been vaccinated or most people in this group um, have been vaccinated with vaccines that were designed for the earlier strains. Right, so I think the and the recommendation is probably going to be for continued boosters at some point. Israel has started a fourth booster. Fourth boosters yeah. are available, or second boosters, I suppose, a four a four shot, but a, a really second booster um, are now available for immune compromised in this country. So we we really and they boost antibody levels. I mean, they seem to be effective. Israeli data is showing that they actually do also prevent infection. The booster. So I think we'll face boosters against older variants. And there are now vaccine developments going on for Omicron. So are we going to see a, a vaccine booster that's been designed for modern variants as well? So I, I think that the, the medical effort is to try and stay on top of this and find booster processes that can help in this. Yes, the Omicron infection that, that people who've been infected in the last month have had is gonna provide some element of protection against other variants. We just don't know how much. Uh, oh, go ahead, you have a follow-up, Jim? No, I was gonna say, so it turns into the flu where you're, you're chasing something that is a moving target, essentially, vaccine-wise. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Allie. Uh, you're up. Okay, great. Um, I don't have a camera on since it, mine turns me sideways in Zoom right now. So uh, so no one has to tilt their head. Um, but I'm class of 07. Um, and my question is around um, the data from wastewater treatment, especially in the Bay Area. Um, I put a link in uh, since now you can see these charts and things um available on the internet um which i didn't know were available before but um you know people are speculating that we're um nearing a peak on the west coast maybe not yet but um we've seen like if you look at if you're looking at the data from um the past two weeks it's for san francisco in particular um we see a dramatic drop in wastewater and then a climb um again this week and i was wondering how you might interpret that um and what your thought is in terms of um uh kind of interpreting the general case load um based on home testing versus um like uh the public testing right okay so two questions i'll turn and take those both separately so um yeah, so we're always looking for the earliest marker of disease activity, right? So hospitalizations is one, but before that you have cases. So you're looking at testing and you mentioned the wastewater. W wastewater has been an earlier indicator of a bumper surge than cases. So before we see a bump in cases, if we're doing surveillance on wastewater, um, we'll see a bump in those cases. And as you mentioned, what we've seen we're actually seeing in California a decline in cases in the last three to five days. And that data is always incomplete because different labs reported different rates and all this other stuff. Um, but the, the wastewater has been, as you mentioned, declining earlier than the cases. We don't know what to make of the bump of the bumps that we've seen in the wastewater. We think it's too early to tell if that's going to be a sustained bump because we've had cases before where there's more of a zigzag pattern of, of cases, hospitalizations. So it's hard to tell if this slight bump in a few areas for wastewater is gonna be anything sustained. We need a little more time for that. For that. But we take the wastewater analysis very closely and correlate that with cases and then with hospitalizations. Um, and then I think if I understand your second case correctly, and this is an important thing that we've talked about for weeks is with the availability of home testing, we're, we're expecting that a lot, uh, a few people are gonna come for a test that actually gets recorded and comes to public health. 
right? Because it, the it, rapid antigen tests, if they're done in a clinic, they get reported to the state. But if you buy if a, a, a COVID test at the pharmacy and you do it at home, there's no mechanism. We, we won't accept that because the, the quality control of the tests and all these other things. So, but all these people may test positive. They have mild symptoms. They stay at home. They may not even ever tell their regular doctor. And now we have a, a case that's documented at home that has that wasn't documented as a as a test case in a lab. So we're expecting to see that. The, the one thing we've always done with the variability in testing, because the other thing that we've seen is there's a drop in testing around holiday weekends, New Year's, Christmas, Thanksgiving. You see the, the number of tests done drop dramatically. People just don't come in. Um, and so what we, the, for me, the, the hallmark has always been looking at hospitalizations. Because what if whatever percentage of patients get sick enough to get medical attention and get hospitalized, that doesn't change that much day to day or week to week. It does over time, and and we analyze that as well. If you see testing drop, but hosp, you know, and then and then confirmed tests, um, positive tests drop, but the hospitalization rates uh, stay the same. That tells us that there was the drop in positive tests correlated just with a drop in tests done, but we still have as much disease transmission in the community. We're seeing the same hospitalizations. So um, the hospitalizations to me are the ultimate uh, measure of what the, what the community transmission is. Cool. Uh, Mark, uh, uh, full name, class year, and senior year house. Sure, Mark Sutton, class of, originally class of 92, ended class of 93, so. Excellent, and where did, where did you live senior year? Senior year, I lived in uh, in the Berkshire Quad, yeah. Cool, excellent, all right, question? All right. So uh, thanks so much for the talk, and my question is about gender and COVID. So my understanding is that since the beginning, COVID has been more deadly to men. I recently saw there was a big article that said for men, life expectancy has dropped by 2.1 years. For women, life expectancy has dropped by 1.5 years. So it's been bad for everyone, but it's been worse for men. I noticed all your slides, you don't have the disaggregated data by gender. So I'm wondering, first of all, is it true that COVID is more deadly for men? And then the follow-up is, is the booster just as effective for men as for women, or is, the boost, is there a difference in efficacy by gender? Thank you. Um, great question. We uh, we do see this. I do see disaggregated data both by gender and by race and ethnicity, mm -hmm. um, and there are variations in both of those categories. So you are correct that the outcomes for men with COVID are worse than they are for women in terms of hosp higher hospitalization rates and higher death rates. It, it's several points. So it's not 20 percent, it's not 30 percent, but it's on the order I think of like four to four to seven percent, if I recall. Um, I don't look at that closely. It hasn't changed that much. I'm not sure what the difference is with Omicron, uh, but there's definitely the case with Delta and with the Alpha variants for sure. I'm sorry, you said it was the, about four to seven percent. Is that what you said? Sorry. Correct. Okay, so it's not that high. At, at first, they were saying it was like 20, 30%, but as the cases float out, it's lower. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Um, oh, and again, I think that's just a gender difference and it doesn't necessarily control for other medical issues. And I, so anyway, that's it's not that big a difference. Okay. Next question comes from a member of the board of the Northern California Alumni Association, Chris Kirby. Hi, Christopher Kirby, class of 81, and I was off campus my senior year. Um, the question I have is this, is you uh, currently we're seeing performance venues, um, theater, uh, those kind of things with, uh, you know, uh, vaccine checks and uh, mastering the performances. Um, and I'm just curious how those kind of, you know, obviously it's a, a function of risk, but how effective those kind of safeguards are in terms of um, preventing infections? So um, they, they, they're effective at different levels. So the, the vaccination checks, if, if you look at the risk of infections from the grappa, you know, four more likely to, to be infected if you're unvaccinated. 
than vaccinated. And then the other, the other information that we haven't reviewed here, but what's the likelihood of uh, an unvaccinated person transmitting versus a vaccinated person transmitting? So a vaccinated person sheds less virus and does so for fewer days. So even I, I would rather be around a vaccinated infected person than an unvaccinated infected person in terms of risk of transmission to me. So I, there is value in the, in the vaccine checks at public sites and restaurants and things like that, because that alone says that individual is at lower risk for having infection. And if they do, they're at lower risk for transmitting it. Ideally, and some meeting do this and meeting spaces is, you know, do like some families do this, you know, get a test the morning that you come for a family gathering. Now that public tests are available, if you're going to see your 97 year old grandmother in the, in the skilled nursing facility, I would do a rapid antigen test that morning before you go. Um, because that, that, that rapid antigen test gives us more information than your vaccine status in terms of your infection risk. So it's definitely the case that having the, the asking rules for uh, group gatherings, mass gatherings, and the vaccine status check decrease the risk of transmission in outbreaks. Uh, I've got an indication that we need to wrap up soon. So I think we're going to wrap up with uh, John Barkin. Is that, I think so. Um, John? Yes. Hi, Jay. Yeah. You're up. Hey, how are you? Um, You're our final question for the evening. Yeah, th um, thank you very much for the presentation. It's it's fabulous. Um, long haul COVID. I don't know if there is any significant statistical data yet as to either the percent of people who are infected who then experience it and or uh, any any other information about long haul. Yes, there is. And this this is, a, this is a, a fascinating part, I think, of medical science for probably years to come to sort out. So the simple answer and the, the numbers I've read are about 15% of patients who are infected with COVID end up with what can be defined as long haul symptoms. Um, so I don't know if it'll be different with Omicron, again, because it had such a different virulence that it may be different. But I think for Alpha and Delta, it was approximately 15%. Um, it's an interesting constellation of symptoms. There are some clinics that are being opened specifically to address long haul COVID. There's medical literature starting to show that it, it can be very similar to fibromyalgia and a lot of nonspecific chronic fatigue, chronic aches, chronic headaches, these other, these other kind of generalized systemic nonspecific symptoms, uh, but obviously very real and, and uh, incapacitating for patients. So I think this is a future of, of medical research around this, just like there was tremendous scientific advancement around virology for HIV uh, and became an, a pandemic globally in the 80s. But so there's more medical research, but it's about 15%. Great. Well, Hernando, thank you. You're, you're a tremendous asset to the Williams community in this rather extremely difficult time. I, I hope this is the last one uh, we'll do on this, but I, I hope if it if we get a new variant, I hope we'll get you back here again to tell us what to do about it. Yeah, and I'm sorry if I was so long-winded with each of the questions. There are probably lots of other questions I didn't address. If you send them to me by email, I'm happy to respond when I can. Fantastic, excellent. Uh, do you want to give that uh, an email that you're comfortable sharing publicly out or? Yeah, of course, for Alumni Association, of course. It's the easiest one is my Gmail. So H, the first initial X is an X-ray and my last name Garzon, H-X-G-A-R-Z-O-N at gmail.com. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Rob Swan and the Alumni Association for helping us put uh, this together and the Northern California Association for sponsoring this. And I wish everyone a pleasant and safe evening. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you for the interest.